Hello and welcome to another collection connection from Cavartha Castle Museum and Art Gallery. My name is Christopher Parry and I work at Cavartha Castle and this is one in a series of videos that we put together to bring the collection to you at home and to tell you a bit about the historical connections between the objects, the history of the building and local heritage in general. This episode is all going to revolve around this painting behind me and the artist. So the portrait you see here has a very old label attached to it and on the label it says Interior of Welsh Cottage at Cairn Coed with Marcus, a well-known local character by H.D. Pierce. Now Marcus's real name is Margaret Morgan and she is depicted here in the year 1880. The painting is unique for many reasons because even up till 1880, it was very rare to get such a high quality oil painting of a local working class character, essentially. This is a person with a lot of skill who'd gone out of their way to find an interesting subject matter and then capture that person and not dress in the scene in any way, trying to make it as natural as possible. So the clothes she's wearing, the house she's in, are all her own. They were the day-to-day -day clothes that she would have worn. You were basically looking through a window into the past of a cottage of a working class person in Kevin Coyd back in 1880. What makes this painting even more special is the artist, Harry Dyke Pierce, Henry Dyke Pierce as he was born, but known as Harry locally. Now Harry Dyke Pierce was himself a Kevin born boy. He was born in 1848 and lived on Church Street in Kevin Coyd from a young age. His father would be lucky enough to make a few shrewd business decisions and eventually own and run the Ponticarpal Brewery, which again was situated underneath the Kevin Coyd Viaduct in Kevin Coyd. From a young age though, Harry showed aptitude of being a good, strong artist. But he didn't embrace that early on. It seems that on various points in his life, he tried out many different things. First off, his father bought him some farmland within Kevin Coyd to start the farm because that's what he was interested in at the time. And so he started changing his life and to become that of a farmer. But he quickly lost interest in that way of life and then embraced that one true love in his life, art and artistry and created art in different ways. He went on to study art in London and luckily we have in the collection some early pencil sketches from the 1860s from Harry Dyke Pierce, which I'll show to you now. After Harry Dyke Pierce ceased his farming career, he threw himself back into that one true love of his art and the creation of art. And we've got a wonderful collection of different sketches. And they all depict different images that have intrigued him. And these are preliminary sketches of things that may or may not have turned into proper full paintings by Harry Dyke Pierce. Most of these are dated in the 1860s, so between the ages of 18 and 21. When he was studying down in London and other places and furthering his artistic career massively. And yet, these are just glimpses into the skill that he had as an artist really. When you look at these sketches, they are reminiscent of any kind of classical artist in training. He was studying for me, he was looking at faces in particular, and he seems almost totally and utterly preoccupied with drawing faces and characters and interesting faces and characters. His career was dominated by painting people and people's faces. In fact, he was awarded in 1883 for depicting a, a boy in Kevin Coyle's soup kitchen. And sadly, we at the museum have never seen this painting. We've only seen very few examples of Harry Dyke Pierce's work. But, needless to say, the majority of the paintings that he did in the 1880s and late 1870s were all cherry-picked by being these interesting characters from around Kevin Coyd. Back to this painting of Marcus for a second though. The year that it was created is special for many things. Crucially, while Harry was painting this painting, he was also one of the central organisers to the largest exhibition of art the Murtha had ever seen. They would call it the Great Art Exhibition of 1880 and it would be held at Merthyr's Drill Hall and Merthyr had never seen the likes of this, a full-scale, gigantic exhibition of art in all its shapes and sizes. 
In the collection, we have two photographs that depict the interior of the drill hole, and this being the old drill hole, so situated on the end of Brecker Road. The building still stands now, it's an MOT garage, but these two images depict how ornate and how amazing the interior of this drill hole was. They decorated it out and even created a fountain in the centre to help people relax in this environment surrounded by the art. Even luckier than that, we have the original register of all the objects on display and the minutes of the meetings in the collection, which I'll give you a look at now. In front of me is the minute book for the Muthra Art Exhibition, and it has certainly seen better days. But as you can see from the front cover, Murtha Art Exhibition list of applications for space. And essentially what this list is, it is a series of listings for all the oil paintings, all the sculptures, everything contained within that exhibition. There was over 248 oil paintings on display, 145 watercolours and 62 photos. Add to that all the other categories of objects and there were over 3,000 objects on display in the drill hall in 1880. Now as we can tell from the minute sheets which are also contained within this book, the first preliminary meeting was held on October the 21st, 1879. And in that meeting they decided to pull in all the favours they can and pull in everyone to organise a gigantic exhibition titled Murtha Art Exhibition. And the idea was, was not to earn money from it, all of the people contributing their time did it voluntarily, so all of the townspeople, Harry Dyke Pierce included, volunteered their time free. But there was a charge for entry, and that was because one of the main things they wanted to do is they wanted to create a fund to start an art school within Murtha to not only show the arts, they wanted to fund the arts locally. They wanted to actually spend money on these talented artists that are scattered around the town. As the minutes go on though, they say that the exhibition was launched on May 27th, 1880 and that it was on for two months. It was just over 50 days that it was on and in that time it attracted 40,000 plus visitors. At the end of the exhibition, they didn't have enough excess funds to fund an art school permanently. So what they did instead, as we can see from the minute book of the finances as well, is they funded an art prize for Merthyr. They also gave surplus money to the hospital, the library and the Kevin Coyd library as well. And so they distributed all the funds that they could to affect directly local people. The book here shows the range of objects on display and it shows specifically and crucially more than anything the amount of support that this exhibition had. These people like Harry Dyke Pierce, like William Crochet and like all of these notable townspeople used their connections wisely and they got the people out there to donate objects and items. We even got medieval mosaic portraits from the museums down in London and in South Kensington. Amazingly, when we in the museum look through this book now, you can see the traces of how Cavartha Castle Museum formed. To give you an indication, on the opposite side of the room I'm in right now, the opposite side where Marcus is featured is a painting by a gentleman called T.H. Thomas, which I'll show to you very quickly now. Hanging just on the wall over here is one of my favourite paintings from Cavartha Castle's collection. It's called Sackcloth and Ashes, a tip girl leaving work and it depicts unashamedly how tip girls worked and dressed in industrial districts like Merthyr. And this was one of the paintings that, were on, that was on display in 1880 in that great exhibition. Scattered throughout Cabartha Castle Museum are remnants of this 1880 exhibition because what happened was the people involved in that exhibition were involved directly in founding Cavartha Castle because this 1880 exhibition was the key, it was the proof that they needed that something like this in Merthyr could be a success and so they started from there on in trying to put into place a permanent 
art gallery space, which ended up being us at Cabartha Castle. And so just a quick wander around, you'll see comparisons from the photos that we've got of the Drill Hall exhibition to the collection that's on display now. I'm in the dining room at Cabartha Castle now, and behind me are the portraits of three of the main crochet family iron masters. And why I'm showing you these is like T.H. Thomas's Tip Girls Leaving Work. These were on display in the Drill Hall in 1880 also. And all of the oil paintings and all of the artwork was curated and displayed by Harry Dyke Pierce. He was the head of the Hanging Committee, which was a subcommittee responsible for displaying and making intriguing all the artwork on the walls. And so when you look at those photos and you see the sheer amount of portraits out there, Harry was the guy responsible for getting in all those and putting them up on the wall. There wasn't just one or two paintings now existing at Cabartha Castle that were involved in this exhibition. Tons of the collection was, which I'll go through really, really quickly. This bust of G.T. Clark, sculpted by Joseph Edwards, a local sculptor, was on display also. This bust of Josiah John Guest, also sculpted by Joseph Edwards. These two Japanese bronze vases were on display also. One of these paintings by Penry Williams of the Merthyr Riots, we're not sure which, but one of them was on display. This very early watercolour by Penry Williams of his father's house in Georgetown was on display. The busts produced by Wedgwood, including a bust of Isaac Newton, was on display. This Swansea oval dish was on display also, along with loads of other ceramics. And this and all the other ceramics were donated in two parts. One by J.H. James of the Cottage up in High Brazil and William Thompson Crochet, who lived in Cavartha Castle, but was then, in 1880, living in Vena House. And here we are, back of the portrait of Marcus in her cottage in Kevin Coyne, painted by a boy from Kevin Coyne. Now, Amazingly, Margaret Morgan was featured in this portrait, outlived Harry Del Pias. Harry passed away in 1895, and a year later, Marcus would pass away as well. But Marcus, unlike Harry, has been immortalised in paint and will always be recognised along the walls of Arthur Castle as one of those truly unique faces from our past. I hope you enjoyed our collection connection today and a look back at not only the painting but of Harry Dyke Pierce's life and of the story of the 1880 art exhibition in Merthyr. So if you did like this, please like the video, share it and subscribe and please talk and comment on it as much as possible. And thank you very much for watching. Au revoir.